Good afternoon to all of you. It is April. It's beautiful here in New York City. Um, it is very much spring here, and it's one of those uh, days that you don't want to skip. You want to get outside and uh, make sure that uh, you capture that great weather. Um, we won't be talking about what's happening a couple miles south of me uh, shortly. That's for someone else's broadcast. But what we will do is uh, bring you up to speed on all that's happening within the world of uh, Bond and the uh, work of our uh, attorneys who have come together to present uh, to you today. And if Kathy, you'd go to the next slide, I'll advance uh, our conversation by walking through the agenda. So I'll be covering uh, the state budget and other state relating issues. Um, and then I'll move over to Colin Leonard, uh, a leader in our Syracuse office, who's going to be talking about the WARN Act. Uh, proposed regulations uh, that will be, I think, important uh, for all of you to better understand. John Harris, who uh, sits just a couple doors down from me here in New York City, um, is on the program for the first time and will be discussing proposed forfeiture regulations, um, which should be also quite interesting for those of you in the uh, plan benefit world. Uh, Justin uh, Dorsino is back, and uh, Justin will be providing updates on litigation affecting New York State's cannabis licensing program. Brian Smith is uh, with us as well, an intellectual property focused uh, attorney uh, who's going to be uh, sharing what's happening at the Supreme Court in IP. We've heard a bit uh, in recent programs uh, on intellectual property issues, and Brian is here to provide us with the latest. So after that, I will uh, wrap up and, of course, take your questions as you have them. So if Kathy, you'd go to the next slide, please. Let me walk through the information that I have on the budget, which is unfortunately precious little. Uh, what we do know is that New York State's budget was due on April 1st. Um, of course, it is April 4th, not April 1st, and we still don't have a budget. Um, but this is not atypical. Um, you know, it was the case um, pretty much regularly before uh, the administration of Andrew Cuomo that budgets were late. Um, the former governor uh, did change that uh, for the most part. Um, with Governor Hochul, uh, budgets have been uh, not always um, right on April 1st, but generally in the vicinity uh, during the somewhat uh, more limited uh, you know, period that we've had to get to know Governor Hochul and her office. Um, we understand and there's signals that you know, the budget could be done um, before April 10th, and there was an extender bill approved uh, that essentially keeps the old budget in place through April 10th. Um, it's, of course, a busy time with lots of holidays for those observing, and so it's feasible that we could be looking into later April before this budget gets done. But as uh, we know more, we'll make sure all of you know more. The key issues remain housing and bail reform, um, and those are really the ones that continue to be negotiated as between the legislative leaders and the governor's office. And with that, let's move to our speakers because we do have plenty coming up today, uh, as I notice or noted when I walk through the agenda. And let me just tell you a little bit about Colin Leonard, who's been on the program uh, before. But to remind all of you, Colin is based in our Syracuse office, where he's a member and uh, the management side uh, labor and employment lawyer. Uh, who has you know vast experience and in that context is here to tell us about the WARN Act proposed regulations that all of you should know a bit more about. And with that, Colin, we're delighted you can make this time and the floor is yours. Thanks in advance. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy to be reporting. That's not the beautiful day that we have apparently in New York City and Syracuse, but I know spring is on the way. Um, so I just wanted to spend a bit of time um, talking about uh, the New York Warren developments. Kathy, if you can advance the next slide, please. So um, we have uh, some new regulations that were proposed uh, and were issued on uh, March 29th. And before I get into the, the details on those proposed regulations, just by way of background, we've had a New York Warren law. It's, it's like a mini Warren law in place since 2009. Um, and it requires employers with 50 or more employees in New York to comply with the law, which essentially means uh, prior to conducting either a plant closing or a mass layoff, individuals affected by those actions must receive advance notice uh, 
90 days that the event is, is slated to occur. Uh, next slide, please. So just, just further background, there are two, there are, there are some other triggers, but there are two main triggers under, under the New York and the federal Warren law. One is a plant closing and the other is a mass layoff. So just, just so you understand, a plant closing is where there's a temporary or permanent shutdown of a single site of employment, which results in employment losses for 25 or more employees, excluding part-time employees. The federal law, which has been in existence for years, is, is triggered by a loss of 50. So New York enacted a statute that has a lower threshold in order to trigger the advance notice requirement. The other main trigger is a mass layoff, which is you know, a large layoff of 250 employees, or if you don't reach that threshold, the layoff in your facility is at least 25 employees. Um, and so it's, it's both these things, it's at least 25 employees, and that number, whatever it is, 25 or more, is at least 33% of the employees at that site. Next slide, Kathy, please. So we've had regulations in place since uh, 2009 when the statute was uh, enacted. Now we have the first set of regulation revisions that are proposed. Again, these are not final, but they really uh, go to a lot of the processes and procedure for employers to comply with New York Warren. And there are also some significant proposals that I wanna highlight through this discussion uh, today. Next slide, please. So the, the New York Warren law is very often becomes a part where you have a sale of all or part of the business. Because very often in those types of transactions, you have um, individuals who may be um, separated from employment or who may transfer uh, employment to, to the buyer. So in that circumstance, there's an exception that's largely applicable in the, in the uh, Warren context that involves the sale of a business. And in general, what that means is if you're employed by the seller and you're part of the transaction with the buyer, then you're, there is no employment loss, essentially, right? You just transfer from working for XYZ company to ABC company, there's no war notice that is required in that situation. However, it becomes a lot more complex when you uh, get involved in the business transactions because very often there's legal reasons why um, the buyer might want the seller to terminate all the employees as of the date of the sale. Without getting into the weeds on that piece, what the Warren regulations have really talked about, or the proposed Warren regulations, is to indicate that where there's a condition in the sale, um, that they, they are going to make it harder uh, in, the, in these situations for sellers and buyers to come to terms, terms on, the, on the transaction, because essentially what the condition is going to require is that um, the buyer is going to have to acknowledge that if there was a condition that the employees would transfer and uh, those employees, some or all of those employees do not transfer, then the liability for issuing the warn notice then falls on the buyer. And we'll have to see how this gets massaged in the final regulations, but my sense is this is gonna create some discomfort in the, in the transactional world in terms of reaching an agreement um, on, on the transfer of employees. Um, so that's the first point. Next slide, please, please Kathy. Another major development, this is, a, this is a brand new piece of the regulations, which was not in place before. Very often in the WARN context where you know you're an employer, you're gonna trigger the WARN notice. Um, and rather than provide 90 days notice prior to separation of employment, there may be a business reason why you might say, you know what, instead of giving the notice and keeping people employed at the site, I'm going to pay the employees in lieu of providing the actual notice. And that's always been a, um, uh, a practice, both under the federal and the New York law, that uh, has been in place and has been, um, I, think, I think, something that has been accepted uh, by the state uh, and, and federal authorities for, for many years. New York is now proposing, New York State Department of Labor is now proposing that in order for an employer to actually follow the pay or to provide a pay in lieu of notice, uh, process in the Warren context, 
you're going to have to have a pre-existing condition or policy in your handbook or in an employment agreement that requires this type of advance notice to be provided. So this is could be, and we'll, again, we'll have to see what the final regulations look like, but this could be a fundamental shift away from at-will employment in New York, right? So we know the default rule in New York is employees are employed at will, meaning the employer or the employee can decide to leave or to, um, you know, to depart from employment at any time for any reason with or without notice. Now, if an employer is actually required by policy to maintain a policy, say, we're going to have to have a policy that provides 60 days or 30 days notice prior to separation, an employer under these proposed regulations is going to have to have that type of policy in their handbook if they ever want to take advantage in the future of the pay in lieu of notice provision. Again, this is a this is a major change. Let's see how it gets fleshed out over the next couple of months. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's also significant changes um, in the exceptions that are that are available to providing notice to requiring notice. There are two main exceptions that apply uh, to limit or eliminate uh, to reduce or eliminate the required 90 day notice period. Um, the two main exceptions are the unfore unforeseeable business circumstances exception or the faltering company business exception. Um, the unforeseeable business ex uh, circumstances exception is when there's something sudden and dramatic, unexpected that occurred, like the loss of a significant uh, client uh, or loss of a significant line of business that wasn't expected. That is, is when potentially the unforeseeable business circumstances exception can apply. The other one is the faltering company. So meaning that it's a company that's been struggling for some time. It's been trying to get new business or capital infused into the, into the company, and it's been struggling to do so. In those circumstances, and particularly the faltering company, there's an exception where if the giving of the notice might dissuade someone from actually injecting that capital. Um, so employers sometimes, where, where it can apply, they, they can assert these types of exceptions. Um, now, under the proposed regulations, they're limiting the exceptions in certain, certain, certain circumstances. For example, the faltering company uh, exception would only apply in the, clay, in the case of a plant closing, not that mass layout that I talked about earlier. And the other thing is they're making significant um, changes, proposed changes to the procedure to get approval for an exception to the notice requirement. It used to be the process was as part of your notice, if you gave some notice, you would assert the exception, provide whatever documentation or evidence was needed to assert the exception. That process will still be in place, but now the Department of Labor is actually going to have to issue a determination, meaning after uh, probably upon some kind of hearing or other proceeding that the, the employer has uh, established the exception uh, through that process. And also, there's going to be a requirement that the employer submit a signed affidavit under penalty of perjury that all of the information that's submitted in support of the exception is uh, true and accurate. Um, next slide, please. Um, finally, uh, as I said, uh, these are proposed. Um, they're not uh, final. And so the public has been invited to submit comments on the regulations up through uh, May 30th. They can be submitted to the email address that I've provided here. And I'm happy to, there's my deadline, my timeline. I'm uh, happy to answer questions and uh, certainly you can reach out to me or anyone else at Bond if you have questions about WARN or anything else in the management side, labor and employment. Thanks, back to you, Gabe. Thank you so much, Colin. And I noticed that there are a few questions that came in during your presentation in the chat. And uh, if you have a moment, uh, you know, kindly do address those. And we're so appreciative of the time you've spent uh, with us. And let me now move then to our next speaker, uh, who's John Harris. John sits, as I noted, just a couple doors down from me here in New York City. Um, in Midtown. John joined our firm earlier this year, um, focused on employee benefits, and is a senior counsel. He is ready to tell us all about proposed forfeiture regulations. And John, really glad that you've joined the program. The floor is yours. Thanks very much. 
John, we're not seeing you presently. So I'm wondering, there you are. Please go sorry. right ahead. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so yes, uh, I am just a few doors down from Gabe and thanks for tossing it down the hallway. Uh, I'm here today to present on the proposed forfeiture regulations that were proposed by the IRS um, that could affect your plan. Uh, and so Kathy, uh, next slide, please. So the first thing we'll do is go over the types of forfeitures that uh, can occur in your plan. And then we'll go over what you can do with those forfeitures under the current laws. Then the next thing will be about what the proposed regulations will do to change that usage and how that will impact your plan. So next slide, please, Kathy. So uh, the, the, we'll go over a couple uh, common types of uh, occurrences that result in forfeitures. So the first one and most common is if there's a termination of employment without, clause, without cause, like if someone quits um, or is uh, terminated just because uh, they didn't, uh, you know, they hit the expectations quite right. In this instance, all of their unfunded employer contributions are forfeited, but they keep their vested employer contributions. So as an example, if a plan has the uh, vesting schedule that is identical to the minimum vesting schedules under the Internal Revenue Code, if an employee is in, uh, finished their third year but leaves before the end of their fourth year, at that time, they are 40% vested in their employer contributions and 60% unvested. So if they leave uh, or terminated without cause, then 60% of their employer, con employer contributions are forfeited and returned back to the plan. The second most uh, common forfeiture occurs when there's a termination for cause. And in this case, the employee or participant forfeits both their unvested and vested con employer contributions. However, the plan does have to have uh, two conditions uh, in, or satisfy two conditions in its plan documents. The first is that it has to have what's actually, it is actually recognized in, ca in case law as the bad boy clause, which um, says that if someone commits serious misconduct or violates a non-compete clause after uh, they've been terminated, they are uh, terminated for cause. The second condition to have this type of for forfeiture is if the vesting schedule is uh, quicker than that under the minimum vesting schedules for the IRS code. It's generally uh, that they're fully vested before five years. So next slide, please. Uh, and then the final two common types of uh, forfeitures are if a plan requires employees to uh, to remit contributions if they have a condition of mandatory contributions. And if an employee withdraws those mandatory contributions and is less than 50% vested, then that employee forfeits all of their employer contributions. Now, in this case, the law does allow the employee to cure that forfeiture by repaying the amount that it withdrew from mandatory contributions but again, this is another uh, type of forfeiture that, that that can occur. And then finally, if there are um, if uh, plans can adopt a policy that if a participant dies, uh, that 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 event causes them to forfeit their unvested and vested employer employer contributions. Uh, this has to be adopted by a plan policy, and it doesn't apply if the plan has some survivor annuities incorporated in, into the plan. Uh, so next slide, please. There are certain special rules for multi-employer plans. If you are part of a unionized, if your employer is a signatory to a collective bargaining agreement, uh, there are special rules for forfeitures in that context. Generally, it's uh, that multi-employer plans are given leeway to reduce benefits or to even suspend benefits if it's to make up for an employer that has ceased its contributions to the multi-employer plan or if the multi-employer plan has to engage in such forfeitures to avoid insolvency. Uh, so uh, if you could go to the next slide, Kathy, thank you. So now after these forfeitures occur and the plan gets, gets its uh, employer contributions back, what can you do with them? Well, under the current law, the, the, the IRS code and ERISA uh, provide different treatments for defined benefit plans, like a pension plan, 
or defined contribution plans like a 401k savings plan. So if there are forfeitures in a, like a pension plan, then under the current regulations, you have to apply the forfeitures as soon as possible to reduce employer contributions. Um, you can also use the forfeitures to pay for plan administrative expenses, like paying your third party administrator, record keeping fees, or compliance charges for uh, doing non-discrimination testing on your plan. Now, for defined contribution plans, the usage of forfeiture is a little bit murkier. Uh, it, it, the regulation currently says that defined contribution plans are supposed to allocate uh, forfeitures to a participant's accounts in accordance with a definite formula. But the IRS has not really um, expounded or, or really uh, detailed what the scope of that uh, regulation encompasses. For example, it's not clear currently whether a defined contribution plan can use forfeitures to pay for uh, the types of administrative expenses that I referenced for the pension plans. Um, there's also a practice among many uh, defined contribution plans to have a separate what's called suspense account where plans will deposit uh, these forfeitures uh, and have in a separate account, separate from the regular asset account, and have those forfeitures accumulate years over years, perhaps even getting interest thereon. Uh, the IRS does not like this practice. Uh, they have put out uh, newsletters. Uh, the last newsletter was in June of 2010, saying that they believe this practice of depositing forfeitures in a, in a uh, suspense account is inconsistent with the Internal Revenue Code. Um, so next slide, next slide, please. But the IRS has been silent on that issue since uh, the that new, June 2010 newsletter, at least in its official capacity. It's not until this past February, February 27th, 2023, where the IRS has proposed new regulations on forfeiture usage. And it does change uh, the current regulations. So first for defined benefit plans, you're no longer supposed to apply, you actually apply forfeitures to lower employer contributions, quote, as soon as possible. Instead, you're supposed to instruct your actuary uh, to incorporate expected forfeitures to calculate the minimum funding level for the plan. This is a little bit of a wonky uh, uh, change. It doesn't really have a practical effect on how uh, plans will, will use their benefits, at least in my view. Um, it's really more to make uh, forfeiture usage mesh with certain uh, more recent legislation concerning uh, pension plans. But for the defined contribution plans, uh, the IRS in these regulations is making it clear that you can use those to pay for administrative expenses and, and reduce employer contributions uh, and increase the benefits of other participants. So now that now these regulations make it clear what uh, defined contrib contribution plans can use the forfeitures for. But perhaps the most uh, important part of the proposed regulation is that uh, the IRS is requiring that plans use the forfeitures within 12 months of the forfeiture. So effectively, that means that the practice of depositing forfeitures in a separate bank account, separate suspense account, is not allowed because you're going to have to uh, apply that within 12 within uh, a plan year, and so you can't keep it in a separate account year after year after year anymore, you have to use it within uh, 12 months. And the IRS recognizes that this might require uh, plans that have been accumulating, uh, be a problem for plans that have been accumulating benefits in their suspense accounts for years. Um, so they have created this transition rule that any pre-2024 forfeiture would be deemed to have occurred in 2024, and under the proposed regulation then, you would have to allocate all of that, those forfeitures to one of the uh, three identified permissible uses within 12 months, so by the end of 2025. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so what does this all mean for your plan? Uh, and I think if your plan is, I think the most important thing is if your plan is uh, depositing forfeitures in a separate suspense accounts, I would advise you, it's, it, you should probably stop doing that. 
Um, because like I said, if this proposed regulation gets put in place, uh, that th there's a rule that's going to require you to allocate that by the end of 2025. Um, plant sponsors and plant administrators should also review their plan documents to determine if there are any amendments necessary um, to specifically state that plant forfeitures must be used within 12 months of forfeiture and also to identify the permissible uses of the forfeitures that we've discussed. Uh, and then also for defined benefit plans, you want to make sure that you uh, tell your actuary to do, adjust its assumptions uh, in, to comply with the law. And so like the uh, proposed regulations for the New York Warren Act uh, that uh, Colin went over just now, these also have a deadline for comments of May 30th, 2023. And the IRS seems to want to implement these by the end of the year because the language uh, seems to suggest that they assume it could start as soon as January 1st, 2024. So uh, we're here at Bond to help you guys with any of your questions uh, and make sure that your documents comply with the proposed regulations. And with that, I'll shoot it back to uh, Gabe. John, thank you so much. And there's a question in the chat for you. Um, and I'm sure that uh, others may pop up along uh, the course of this afternoon. Really glad that you could come on the show. And uh, of course, come on back if you have new information to share with us. Let me move to our next speaker then, please, if uh, we can, Kathy. And Dustin is back with us uh, from Syracuse. Uh, Dustin has been on the program a number of times previously to talk about uh, the evolving world of cannabis and uh, both uh, regulatory aspects, uh, litigation aspects, uh, all of that continues to move in New York State. And there's an important set of updates that Dustin thought were ready for all of you to learn about. So Dustin, thank you for coming back. I'll turn it over to you and um, I'll be watching the chat for questions. Uh, thank you, Gabe, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I've been on this program a few times in the past, all of which to talk about uh, New York's cannabis licensing program. And like Gabe said, there are a few de few recent uh, litigation-related developments that are affecting that licensing program that I'm happy to uh, update you all on today. Uh, Kathy, if you could go to the next slide, please. So by... By way of background, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, the licensing program in New York State is currently open for a specific type of applicant group called conditional adult use retail dispensary applicants, which are only available to so-called justice involved uh, individuals. Um, and to date, uh, there's only been 66 uh, hard licenses awarded to those applicants, uh, although 99 more of them were awarded on Monday, as I will get, uh, get into a little later. Um, but unfortunately for consumers, only seven of those card licensees have been able to open their doors thus far, uh, most, most of which are located in uh, Manhattan and the Bronx. Uh, one is in Ithaca, one is in Binghamton, but other than that, um, it's, it's, it has been a little bit of a stall in getting those dispensaries to uh, open up. And the, the application period for the remaining uh, non-conditional applicants uh, is set to open in the fall. Uh, and that, that lag in opening is partly due to some recent litigation that's been filed against New York State and the, their Office of Cannabis Management that is affecting the cannabis licensing program, which I will uh, get into in the next slide. Uh, please, Kathy. Okay. Uh, so the, the first lawsuit uh, that was filed a few months ago was filed by a, a Michigan-based card applicant called Verisite. Um, they argued that the, the New York cannabis regulations violated the dormant commerce clause of the U.S. Constitution because those regulations require all of the card applicants to have a significant presence in New York State, which involves either being incorporated in New York State or having a principal corporate location within New York State. 
uh, Verisite, uh, the, its true party of interest is a, a Michigan-based applicant who was arrested and convicted of a marijuana-related offense under Michigan law, not New York state law. Whereas under the New York regulations, the applicant must be majority owned and controlled by a justice-involved individual, which requires a conviction related to marijuana under New York law, not Michigan law. Um, and so after hearing arguments, the Northern District of New York issued a preliminary injunction barring the Office of Cannabis Management from issuing any card licenses in those five regions. Um, the, uh, Judge Sharp of the Northern District of New York specifically found that the cannabis regulations uh, discriminate against out-of-state applicants over in-state applicants. Um, and now, uh, as, as you might have imagined, New York State has appealed this case up to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And just last week, the Second Circuit uh, issued a preliminary order modifying the preliminary injunction that Judge Sharp issued. And that injunction is now limited to only the Finger Lakes region, which was their site's number one choice of a geographic location for its dispensary. And because of that modification of the injunction, New York State was able to issue those additional 99 uh, card dispensary licenses yesterday. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. Uh, this next uh, lawsuit was just recently filed, so we don't know a whole lot uh, about this one yet. But a group of large cannabis organizations and multi-state operators filed suit against New York State claiming that the, the same program, the CARD program, was unconstitutional because it claimed the Office of Cannabis Management overstepped its authority and acted as the legislator in authorizing these new license types to be issued before the rest of the general public could apply. Uh, this large group of plaintiffs argued that their... Um, argued that the, the card regulations violated the plain text of New York's Marijuana uh, Regulation and Taxation Act, uh, specifically citing a provision that said the initial adult use retail dispensary application period should open to all individuals at the same time. Uh, but what's interesting about this um, lawsuit and what Bond will be following and providing updates on is that the, the plaintiff did not ask for any injunctive relief um, related to the card program, which is what allowed New York State to go ahead and issue those 99 additional licenses yesterday. Uh, it wants the program declared unconstitutional, and it wants to compel the Office of Cannabis Management to stop out any illicit cannabis stores that are selling cannabis that is unregulated, untested, and without a license. And finally, the, the ultimate goal of this lawsuit would be to open up the application period for cannabis licenses to everyone all at the same time. Um, and, and Kathy, if you would just go to the next slide, please. Uh, that, is, that is all that I have to say about these two lawsuits. And I know that uh, Bond's other cannabis attorneys will be providing updates as they progress through the courts. Dustin, thank you for coming back as always. And we look forward to hearing from you when there's more news. And I'm really glad that you could take the time today. Um, let's shift to our final speaker for the afternoon. That's Brian Smith, who is an attorney focused on intellectual property. Um, started as a physicist, as an undergrad, and then uh, went to Boston College for law school. Um, and it is based uh, upstate in our Rochester office, also a senior counsel, and is ready to share with us information about what's happening at the Supreme Court in the intellectual property space. Um, Brian, we're really glad that you're on the program today. And let me turn it over to you for more detail. Good afternoon, Gabe. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I, as Gabe mentioned, I'm in the uh, IP department within Bond. Um, we help assist clients in both patent procurement as well as uh, patent litigation. 
And today I'm going to be focusing on a, a case update regarding a very important uh, patent law related case that's uh, presently before the, the Supreme Court. Uh, and if Kathy, if you could advance the next slide, please. So the, the case is uh, Amgen versus Sanofi. And um, Bond was fortunate to be able to uh, file an amicus brief on behalf of several law professors uh, in support of the respondents to Nofi, uh, led by uh, Jeremy Ocek, who is the head of uh, our IP department and located in the Buffalo office. Um, so I'm uh, gonna, gonna give a brief update on this uh, ca exciting case, the context of it and why it's uh, extremely important for uh, patent law going forward. Uh, Kathy, if you could advance to the next slide, please. So the, the heart of the patent system is the quid pro quo between inventors and uh, the general public in that inventors are able to obtain a period of exclusivity uh, with respect to their inventions in exchange for fully disclosing their inventions to the public. In that regard, the patent statute requires that uh, patentees describe their invention with sufficient uh, disclosure to allow a skilled practitioner to make and use the claimed invention. And that's part of the uh, patent statute. And the courts have added a gloss to that, that it must they must be able to make and use it without undue experimentation. Um, so that really goes to the heart of the, so the heart of the issue in this case is what must uh, an inventor disclose in, in order to fully enable the patent such that a skilled practitioner can make and use that invention uh, when the period of exclu exclusivity has expired. Kathy, if you could please advance to the... Um, so I think uh, this case is really interesting given the context of it, which it arises in the life science. Um, and this the, the underlying problem was uh, treatment for high cholesterol and particularly a naturally occurring protein within the body that uh, binds to and causes destruction of uh, liver cell receptors that are uh, able to remove cholesterol from the bloodstream. So uh, the more of this protein that exists in the bloodstream, uh, the higher levels of cholesterol. And um, Kathy, if you could please advance the next slide. So the solution that was uh, generated was uh, the development of antibodies that are able to inhibit the protein within the body uh, to prevent that protein from destroying the liver cell receptors. And these antibodies are made up of amino acid chains with unique sequences that can be uh, quite complex. And that's where um, the underlying issue was generated um, for this particular case. Kathy, if you could advance to the next slide, please. So just to give a um, an idea of what's at stake for the parties in this case, um, each of the parties had a competing uh, treatment uh, using developed antibodies. Uh, Amgen, the petitioner at the Supreme Court, uh, markets their product under Rapatha. And as you can see, they've had uh, significant sales uh, in that space. Uh, and if we, Kathy, if you could advance to the next slide, um, Sanofi Regeneron also had a uh, competing product, and this was the acute, the product that was accused of infringing Amgen's patent rights. Um, and as on, shown on the next slide, um, Amgen was able to obtain um, several patents related to the particular antibodies that are useful in this case. Um, and as, as shown on the screen, there's a couple of particular patents that were issued uh, at, at issue in the litigation. And Kathy, if you could advance to the next slide, please. And the issue with asserting these patents arose uh, based on the way that Amgen had tried to claim their antibodies in what's called a, a functional genus claim. So basically they broadly claimed a genus of antibodies that provided the function necessary to lower cholesterol. Um, Amgen also had separate patents related to the specific antibodies that they had developed 
But those patents are fairly narrow given the con uh, complex nature of the antibody sequences that could be um, altered while still providing the same functionality. So it's notable that Amgen actually holds that separate patent on the specific sequence of its product, uh, Repatha, but the prolulent uh, product developed by Sanofi does not infringe that patent. That's why Amgen was uh, attempting to get the, this much broader coverage using the functional genus claim that's simply related to the function of the antibody in uh, blocking the binding of the, the protein PCSK9. And Kathy, if you could advance to the next slide. So I'll uh, briefly mention this case had a, a very long procedural history. It was initiated back in 2014, um, and there's been a couple of uh, jury trials on this. Um, and so it's taken quite a, a path to get to the Supreme Court. Uh, and I, and this oral argument was actually heard uh, last week. So we expect a decision on this case um, sometime this summer. So Amgen sued Sanofi in October of 2004 for inf its infringement of its patent rights based on those uh, functional genus claims. Uh, it eventually went back for a second jury trial. Uh, Kathy, if you could advance the next slide, please. And um, in that case, the district court overturned the jury verdict and uh, found that the claims at issue were not enabled and in that the, there would be undue experimentation required in order to enable the full scope of the claims. And that was the issue that went up on appeal to the federal circuit, which is the court which handles all uh, patent appeals. Kathy, if you could advance to the next slide, please. The federal circuit upheld that invalidity finding and they, they de determined that Amgen's uh, broad functional genus, genus claims were not enabled under the patent statute. In particular, they applied the federal circuit's test that requires a, uh, for a claim to be enabled, that it must enable the full scope of the claim. So the, the question becomes whether it uh, Amgen's disclosure had enabled someone skilled in the art to make and use all of the antibodies that were encompassed within its broad functional claim. So all antibodies that block the protein of interest. Uh, and the, the Fed, federal circuit held that there was just too much uh, experimentation and uncertainty that would allow someone to be able to make and use the full scope of that uh, invention. And they noted that there was only uh, 26 working examples provided in a field of uh, millions of antibodies that could potentially provide the recited function. So Kathy, if you could advance to the next slide, please. So Amgen uh, appealed to the Supreme Court challenging the federal circuit's use of the full scope of the claim uh, test for enablement um, and argued that it's beyond the statutory requirements for enablement that um, have been passed down from the Patent Act. Uh, it was a bit surprising that uh, the Supreme Court took up this case as an issue um, but as you can see, as we can, uh, will be clear in, in further slides, it became a very uh, intensely debated issue um, from some very high level stakeholders. Um, so Kathy, if you could please advance to the next slide. So the important issue that will be decided by the Supreme Court is um, how do they how does the enablement standard exist such that it can uh, meet up with these competing goals of the patent system? That is, how do applicants obtain broad coverage for their inventions, uh, particularly in the life science and chemical areas where the uh, particular structure of the antibodies in this case or uh, another chemical may be easily changed, but still provide the functionality that makes the invent, uh, invention valuable, while at the same time ensuring that applicants are disclosing, disclosing enough in their application so that skilled practitioners can make and use the invention without experimentation. 
So on the side of Amgen, the argument is these broad functional genus claims need to be allowed to uh, encourage companies to invest in research development so that they can bring their products to market without fear of competitors easily getting around by um, changing a minor aspect in the structure of uh, an amino acid sequence and an antibody. Um, on the other hand, uh, Sanofi argues that providing these um, large scoped claims um, negatively impacts the market by uh, preventing competitors from bringing a product that doesn't necessarily infringe on what the uh, party has actually invented. Kathy, if you could advance the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, oral argument was heard uh, last week in this case, and it's it's still unclear what the Supreme Court will do here. Um, it's somewhat interesting as to why they uh, decided to pick up this case. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see whether the Supreme Court will overturn the Federal Circuit's clay, uh, prior decisions uh, whether they'll provide initial guidance on how to uh, deal with enablement issues, but this will be important for guiding clients in both um, patent procurement and as well as litigation strategies for potentially invalidating validating overly broad claims. And just um, the final two slides, I've just included uh, some images of the am amici that were in support of both Amgen and Sanofi. Um, it's a large, uh, interesting number of companies from both uh, on both sides of the aisle, from both the uh, science and legal world. So, um, you know, while there was some uncertainty why the Supreme Court uh, took up this case, it certainly has generated a lot of interest and um, Bond will continue to evaluate the uh, impacts of this case to advise clients. Thank you. Brian, thank you. Really glad that you uh, walked us through and please come back in June when we hear from the court on this to help us understand uh, how the court decided and why. And uh, for all of you looking to reach out to us, uh, our contact information, uh, at least among those who presented, is there on the slide that Kathy's displayed. I'll be back with you in about two weeks time next week. Kristen Smith will be hosting, and we're looking forward to uh, having you with us then. In the meanwhile, please enjoy these first days of spring and wishing you all a terrific afternoon.